If you think the Arabic language sounds dramatic and mysterious, you are not the only one. It has that epic journey through the desert vibe where the soundtrack sounds like an incantation and you just know your mouth is going to be making a lot of strange shapes it's never even thought of. But to really understand amazing Arabic, we must journey back in time. <laughs> وايضا سالت المشاركين والممثلين والمغنيين في الاوبرا عن رايهم بعد الفعاليه هم قالوا انه الشعب السعودي اجمل جمهور صح انا ما قلتها Arabic is a language that takes back at least 1600 years some say more than 2 and a half thousand years it is a northern semitic language named after the arabs of the old arabian peninsula the word arab means nomad or desert dweller which is Pretty cool, but there are many theories on the origin of the word, and it also happens to mean eloquence of speech. Soon, you will see why. Today, Arabic is the native tongue of more than 200 million people and the fifth most spoken language in the world. Now, that makes at least 422 million people who speak it altogether. It's the official language of 22 countries, it's the mother tongue in another 11, and is one of the six official languages of the United Nations. Most Arabs use a standard version of the language formally, and it's the kind of golden thread connecting all Arab nations. But if you had to speak standard Arabic on the street, you're going to get a lot of funny looks. It's just not done. In their everyday lives, you see, all Arabs speak a dialect, and there are many of them, over 30 different varieties. The formal version, that standard version, is called Modern Standard Arabic, or MSA, basically a modernized form of classical Arabic. But the regional dialects can be so different from each other that sometimes even Arabic people themselves cannot understand people uh, from another, another country speaking Arabic. Fun demos are coming up. And it's way more interesting than just one mother tongue with a bunch of offspring. In fact, none of the dialects of Arabic even descend from MSA, from Standard Arabic. Curious? Don't worry, you're about to get a peek behind the veil. The first to speak Arabic were the Amaliq, great giants who traveled to Arabia from Babylon. And they and Gurhum are the Arab Ariba, the language of ancient giants. There is no shortage of intriguing origin stories for Arabic. It's not really surprising for an ancient language that came out of the endless Arabian deserts where people were nomadic Bedouins searching for their own origins. Now, in and around Arabia, there were many different languages, Sumerian, Akkadian, and all sorts of fascinating kingdoms like Sheba and Ubar. The oldest written thing that even hints at Arabs is an Assyrian inscription on this monolith from 852 BC. It's a war story and mentions destroying 1,000 camels of a king called Gindibu the Arab. Hmm. Then suddenly we see these guys called Nabataeans, a powerful Arab tribe, and we're looking for evidence of their language. Indeed, there are thousands upon thousands of inscriptions from this region that shows us that uh, the Arabs had a very high rate of literacy, especially in the northern parts of Arabia. Because indeed, even as far back as the second half of the first millennium BC, we find a few inscriptions and examples of language expression that does have strong characteristics of Arabic and which probably is an earlier form of that very language. The difference here is that these examples of Proto-Arabic are not written in the Arabic script, which wasn't invented yet, but in various different alphabets. It is only when we read them out loud, so to say, that we recognize its character as being essentially an Arabic or close to Arabic. And for a long time, Arabic didn't have a writing system of its own. But then in the 4th century, they found an inscription in a town near Aleppo, Syria, that's definitely Arabic, at least Nabataean Arabic. This alphabet descended from the Aramaic alphabet. You can see the whole evolution here. Absolutely fascinating. The Nabataean alphabet had fewer consonants than Arabic, so during the 7th century they created some new Arabic letters by adding dots to existing ones. I'll save the detail about how the writing works for a little bit later. Fun fact, it was cursive Nabataean that turned into Arabic. Arabia, the largest peninsula on Earth, with endless seas of sand from north to south. For millennia, it was home to nomads, who journeyed from oasis to oasis. The ancient caravan route by which incense, silk and precious stones were transported to the Mediterranean world. A trade brought riches. We don't know for certain how the different Arabic dialects came about because there are a few theories on this. 
But the nomads and traders who spoke these dialects spread the language far and wide along their trade routes throughout the Arabian Peninsula and along the Silk Roads. Of course, nothing spread the language like Islam did, and after the year 632, when Muhammad died, there was just no stopping it. The empire expanded despite great distances, deserts and mountains, to the south of the peninsula and the Mesopotamia, to northern Africa and the Taurus Mountains, and to the far corners of the earth. Something was said, especially by a famous poet, it had the potential of spreading like wildfire. At this point, we are into the early Middle Ages, and classical Arabic came out of the medieval dialects, or perhaps from poetry. Poetry has always been at the heart of Arabic culture, and the different tribes had started using a sort of common language for poetry so that they could understand each other. Isn't that nice? In fact, medieval Arabic literature often mentions this idea that the Bedouins spoke a purer Arabic than the city dwellers did. So if a poet praises you, you could be remembered and respected for generations. But if he insults you, or your tribe, that could mean that you are completely ruined. Now remember what he said when we get to the synonym. Bottom line is this, classical Arabic became the highest form of Arabic, the kind found in the Quran and literature and all those epic poems of the time. The dialects even started borrowing words from the classical language, a lot like what happened between the Romance languages and Latin. So there's a bit of cross-pollination uh, going on there with pronunciation too. This is interesting. Medieval scholars didn't bother studying and comparing Arabic with other languages because they believed all other languages to be inferior to Arabic. Modern, educated Arabs saw the bigger picture, thank goodness. Anyway, while Western Europe was experiencing the Dark Ages, the Arabs experienced the Islamic Golden Age, a time where their culture really flourished. Arabic became the language of science, philosophy, and literature, and many important works in these fields were written in Arabic. There was this place called Baghdad's House of Wisdom. Caliph El Ma'mun founded the Arab Empire's most famous scholarly institution, the House of Wisdom. There, Arabs and Persians, Christians and Jews, collected and translated the most important writings from all over the world. They did translations at the House of Wisdom and tried to impress the boss. And if you wanted to rise higher in class, you learned standard Arabic, of course. Meanwhile, in northern Africa, there were two waves of Arabization, and the mingling of different tribes and languages meant that many local dialect forms of Arabic started showing up, and these dialects were different from the Bedouin varieties. So there were a lot of them, you betcha. MSA, Modern Standard Arabic, which is basically modernized classical Arabic. Uh, this term is mostly used by Western linguists, but amongst the Arab, they just call it Al Arabi Al Fusha, the classic or the eloquent Arabic, which is the Arabic that you can find in the Quran, the Arabic that you can find in the hadith of the Prophet, the original one basically. Eventually, Arabic grammar needed to be standardized because an enormous amount of people were speaking it, and all the non native converts were trying to read Arabic and making mistakes, and of course, that led to pronouncing things wrong. Okay, so they needed a writing system that wasn't quite so ambiguous. And the guy who saved the day was called Abu al-Aswad al-Duali. He was a well-known poet, now known as the father of Arabic grammar. He made the grammar easier to understand and came up with all those dots on all those letters. We're still getting to the dots. It's coming up. Also helpful, someone wrote the first Arabic dictionary and called it Kitab al-Ain, the book of the letter Ain. By the end of the 8th century, Arabic was finished being standardized. Great. So, can't we just speak the standard kind now? It's the language of the holy book, al Quran. It's the language found in books, in magazines, in newspapers. So it's the real Arabic classical language that nobody speaks in the streets. <laughs> nobody speaks standard Arabic. It's like speaking Shakespearean English, and nobody will, uh, everybody will laugh. So that is a firm no. However, most books are written in MSA and all politics and media are written and spoken in MSA. In fact, it would be strange to use a dialect in an official news report and a very quick way to lose people's trust. As for Arabic language classes, chances are you will learn modern standard Arabic. But as you heard, it's nobody's mother tongue and Arabic communities simply don't speak it, not anyway. In fact, all Arabs grow up learning a dialect. 
more on the dialects coming soon, but hang on, back to the 16th century. In 1514, the first Arabic printed book was made in Italy, of all places. And as you're about to see, European things were catching the Arab eye. The Egyptian expedition launched by Napoleon in 1798 caused a shockwave. The French reached Egypt with ships and soldiers, but they also brought with them 177 scholars specializing in all sorts of subjects. Cultural capital, printing, engineering, medicine, all these innovations that the Europeans brought to Egypt brought to light the decline of the Arab world, which led to a great movement of introspection, reforms, and campaigns to fight illiteracy. The Arabs also had a renaissance. It was a cultural movement that flourished in the Ottoman Empire, sometimes called the Arab Awakening or Enlightenment. Writers tried to fuse Arabic and European literature and simplify it so ordinary people could also enjoy it. To get things going, the leader of Egypt sent an Egyptian scholar to Paris. He wrote down everything he observed and published his book, The Gold of Paris. This movement was therefore one of the most important things in the Arab world at that time. The Gold of Paris, and the book rhymed. I'm not kidding, he wrote all this in rhyming prose. They just can't help themselves, can they? You'll also see this rhyming style in 1001 Nights. Now, Arabs call this kind of writing sedja. There's this fanciful idea that when you read this style of writing, it sounds like the cooing of a dove. One more reason that Arabic is so special. And as a quick sidebar, he did also learn French while he was there. Good man, why not? Anyway, what followed was a big translation campaign to turn all the important European cultural and scientific works into Arabic. Next thing, some academies were set up to make sure Arabic keeps up with the times. More of that French inspiration, I see. Okay, wahshani awi awi awi. Washufik insha'Allah b'khair. Yalla, salam. I understood salam. Yeah. It gets awkward in the beginning because people are speaking to you in Arabic and then yeah. you're like, sorry, say that again, and they're like, hold on, do you speak Arabic or not? Yeah, they're like, are you, are you actually <laughs> yeah, Arabic? Yeah. Like, like, well, I am, but it's complicated, you know? <laughs> like, I'm speaking Arabic, but yeah. I think you're not, so. <laughs> now, just because you're Arabic, it doesn't mean you know what Arabs are saying. Each Arabic-speaking country or region has its own variety of colloquial spoken Arabic. Any guesses which is the most popular and widely used? Come on, take a guess. In the comments, I'll tell you in just a moment. The main modern dialect groups are those of Arabia, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, and North Africa. There's also Lebanon, Jordan, Algeria, but even in a single country, you'll find a bunch of local dialects. What you hear in Cairo is a little different from what you'll hear in Aswan. Halba. So in Libya, Halba. In Tunis, it's Barsha. And there's a song, Barsha, Barsha, Yumalim, Barsha. In the Gulf countries, they would use the word Wayid. In Egypt, they say Awi. Now, I hope you're taking notes here if you are interested in learning Arabic. Knowing one dialect doesn't guarantee easy communication throughout the Middle East. What my advice? Learn the Egyptian dialect if you're interested in spoken Arabic, because Egyptian Arabic is well known in the Arab world, mostly because of the enormous amount of movies coming out of Egypt. But Arabic speakers are often quite good at Egyptianizing their speech, which is pretty helpful. By the way, the dialects aren't usually written, at least they weren't. These days, the dialects show up in letters, poetry, cartoons, comics, plays, and of course, social media. Don't ever forget social media. So satisfying. Now, I used to love writing in Arabic, and when you get good, you can do some amazing calligraphy if that's, if that's your thing. Let's start with the alphabet. It looks like this. There are 28 letters and they're all consonants with no capital letters. If you're wondering where the vowels are, well, there aren't any, at least none that you can write. It'll make sense in just a minute. First, the Arabic alphabet is just 18 shapes, but you can add diacritical marks to some of them to end up with 28 different phonetic sounds. This letter is ba. It has a dot on the bottom. The next letter is called ta. The next letter is called tha. Now you will spot a few more letters in there that look the same. So obviously the dots are really important if you want to know which consonant you are reading. Can you imagine how it was before when people had to read without any of those dots? A little scary. As for those missing vowels, well, vowel sounds exist in Arabic. There are three short and three long ones. So does Arabic want you to guess? There is two conditions for you to be able to read in Arabic without the harakat, without the vowels. Now the first one is that you know the words 
you are reading, like you have memorized them before, you know what it means, and that you understand the topic slash context of what you are reading about. Now, if these two are in place, if these two conditions are in place, then get ready to read Arabic without harakat like a pro. But until then, what you need to focus is on building your vocabulary and, um, and building your mental dictionary of Arabic. Yes, build your vocabulary. Vowels are tricky. Voweling is the reason non-native Arabic speakers find it so difficult to read Arabic, as I can certainly remember myself. But once you can read, you can guess the vowel from the context. In any case, there's a cheat sheet for you as a beginner, something that's used in the Quran and in classical poetry or books for children and foreign learners. There are diacritics to show you where the short vowels are. So take the Arabic uh, word for girl, which is bint. This is how you write the word without vowels. And here it is with the vowel I, the I sound in the middle. So you write the short vowel as a line below the consonant. Now, as for the long vowels, they're represented by these three consonants. Letters with a double function. Yes, but I will save that particular explanation for one of our story learning Arabic courses. Now, this kind of consonant only alphabet is called an abyad. Try it out in English. It's really not so hard to figure out once you've got the consonants there, what the actual word is. Now, reading and writing goes from right to left. So, for example, take my book of Arabic short stories. You don't start at the front, you start at the back, and then you open it up. And when you get, uh, when you get pages with text, you start at the, let's see if I can get it. Yeah, there we go. You start at the right and move to the left, not the other way around like in English. It's really not as hard as it looks once you get used to it. So you write Arabic like you'd write cursive, joining the letters up, although in Arabic the letters are joined even in printed text. This means each letter has variations depending on the letter that comes before and after, usually four variations depending on if it's at the beginning, middle, or end of a word, or on its own. It sounds all kind of complicated and scary, but just like anything, you get used to them quite easily, and once you do, they're very easy to write. And remember that any writing that you do is only going to be in modern standard Arabic, nothing else. Mind you, it is possible to write Arabic using the Latin alphabet. It's called the Arabic chat alphabet or the Franco-Arabic alphabet. And um, locals use this a lot, actually, especially when they're texting. And it lets you use the old ABC to spell out words phonetically. So there's, a, there's another cheat if you really need it. But I wouldn't recommend learning that way because otherwise you're going to be really stuck when it comes to reading actual Arabic. By the way, in Israel, people write Arabic using the Hebrew alphabet, and you can even write Arabic in the Syriac alphabet. On the other hand, you can use Arabic letters to write in Persian and all of these languages. So is Arabic fascinating? You bet it is. We even added Arabic to our lineup of story learning courses recently, and it's coming out very, very soon. And if you'd love to learn Arabic, well, and, and if you'd like to try learning Arabic through stories, and what better language to learn through stories, seriously, then Arabic Uncovered is a complete language course that takes you from absolute beginner in Arabic to an intermediate level using the magic of stories. The aim is to teach you to think in Arabic so you can pick it up in a very natural way and get talking soon, just like all those Arabic kids out there are doing, because that's what stories allow you to do. There's a seven day free trial available and it really is a lot of fun. So look for the link below in the description and give it a shot. <laughs> okay, I never mentioned it being hard, but it can be. Now, the guttural back of the throat sound, ayn, which a lot of people associate with Arabic, this one took me uh, yeah, a whole bunch of time to practice, and I still can't do it very well. But I promise you, your throat and your mouth does get used to saying the tricky Arabic letters, and only six or seven of them are really quite different from English. The most famous example uh, is a very rare sound called the dead. In the Arabic alphabet, it's written like this, and it's so unique that Arabic is sometimes called the language of the dead. But overall, Arabic is mostly phonetic, which is really helpful. Just remember things change if you're going into the dialects. It's always about the dialect. Arabic letters aren't always pronounced the same, especially the vowels. We have awf, which is a lion when it hunts at night. We have haida, which is a short lion. We have Qaswara, which is a lion when the animals are fleeing from it. We have Layth, which is a lion when he's circling his, uh, his prey. We have Usama, which is a lion only when it's leaping to attack. My friends, if you think you have a good word for something, Arabic probably has 10, and therefore you can often be amazingly precise. Camel, sword, water, rain, all the same story. Lion, by the way, has three to four hundred synonyms. 
They say sword has 1,000. But why does Arabic have so many words for the same thing? Well, let's start with how many words there are altogether. Brace yourself. More than 12 million. You see, in the old Arabic world, before people were literate, the usual way to spread news and tell stories was through poetry. Now, remember this guy? There are stories about poets who became so powerful that at times all it took was a single line of poetry to make a tribe lose its status. And so with that kind of motivation, the Arabs became masters at expressing themselves. Now, you're going to love this. Arabic has a unique and amazing way of building words. The secret to a word's meaning is all in the root. Nearly every word in Arabic is based on a combination of three letters that together form a root, and each root represents a different concept. So all the words that come from this one root will mean something around that concept. Kaf, ta, and ba, kataba. And that's the verb to write. Kataba, he wrote. Katabat, she wrote. Here that's kutub, kutub sound in each word. The kutub, KTB letter combo carries the meaning of writing. And if you use this root, you can make lots of other words related to writing, like book, writer, library, and so on. Another one, le, a, but, le, carries the idea of playing, or there's the RSL, this root means sending. Then you make a more, to make a more specific meaning, you just add vowels and maybe other consonants. It's like adding prefixes and suffixes, except you can add them in the middle of a word. The cool thing is once you know the root word, you will start seeing patterns and recognizing so many other words. It's really quite ingenious how it works, although it does require a bit of a mind shift from English. Now, as for the rest of the grammar, modern standard Arabic is a verb subject object language, but sometimes word order is different, it can change. If it's a pronoun in front, word order changes to subject, verb, object, and pronouns can be quite interesting in Arabic. But this symbol, I wanted to compare to this, kum. Kum ending is also is an attached pronoun, but this is uh, telling us we are speaking to plural, meaning more than two people, three and above. That's a plural. Yeah. So kum. Now, when you say assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and you only one person in front of you, why is it that we are using kum ending, which is used for plural? Uh, the idea behind that is, as a Muslim, we believe that um, you are not alone. Although we are greeting you one person, we believe that you are surrounded by angels as well. So our greeting is to you and to the accompanying angels as well. Arabic uses masculine and feminine gender. Verbs have regular conjugation and they're inflected for three persons and three numbers. There are two tenses, the perfect and the imperfect. There are three cases, which means nouns get special endings to show their function in a sentence. But you'll be glad to know that they've pretty much disappeared from the spoken dialects. Whew. You've probably heard the word Habibi in songs, but do you know any other Arabic words? I think we should give you a few to try out. They are lovely to say. Arabic is very romantic and emotional, so you get a lot of my moon and my light. And as for the word love, well, we're back to those synonyms again. I'm aware of 14 words, but some people claim there are 50. At least it's not a thousand. Who knows? al hub al hawa al sabwa al shagaf al wajd al kalaf al ushq al najwa al shawq al wasab al istikana al wad al khulla al gharam pre-islamic arabic took a lot of loan words from other semitic languages like aramaic ethiopic and syriac and during the early islamic conquests iranian languages like persian also gave tons of words to arabic hellenistic greek as well so has Arabic influenced other languages in turn? You bet it has. It's been most important in Islamic countries, but all of these languages have some Arabic in them. Did you spot yours in there? See, modern Hebrew was also influenced by Arabic, which is not at all surprising since they're both languages of Israel. And if you want to know about the Spanish connection, Arabic in Spain, it's an interesting story, and I went into it in this video. As for words that English borrowed from Arabic, they mostly came via Mediterranean languages. And interestingly, Swahili and most Berber varieties took some of their numbers from Arabic. And by now, there's just one thing you still want to know.
Now, she's American, by the way. Think you could sing in Arabic? What an epic goal to set. <laughs> YouTube, right? <laughs> Truth time. Arabic is considered one of the most difficult languages to learn, but Arabic is really not as hard as people think, especially if you've got a good motivating reason to learn. The dialects are usually easier because there's just less confusing grammar, easier pronunciation, and in general, fewer rules to remember, but you will struggle to get good materials to learn with for the simple reason that it is a spoken language. Get a good grasp of modern standard Arabic first as a foundation, is my advice. That way you can understand the structure of the language and read some pretty cool storybooks like this one. And then, well, it's a lot easier to move on to a dialect. Meanwhile, I have a feeling you're really gonna love this next video.